you need police, fire, medical? Um, maybe both. I'm not sure. There's just someone screaming outside. So you think he's yelling help? Yes. All right, what is your... There's gunshots. You just heard gunshots? Yes. How many? This one. A chilling 911 call from the night of the shooting. Back now, Robert Zimmerman Jr., George Zimmerman's brother. Uh, Robert, when we talked last time, you said that you had absolutely no doubt, and your father also said this, that the cries for help that we heard on one of the other audio tapes definitely came from George. Since I spoke to you last, independent analysis has proved almost conclusively, not 100%, I accept, but almost conclusively, based on studying your brother's voice, that it could not have been George crying for help. How do you react to that? Well, you know, first and foremost, the most important reaction is to understand that independent analysis like that is not admissible. Um, I don't know, and, and like I said, I can't comment uh, about the investigation or specifics in, in the investigation as they stand now because there has been an arrest. However, to say, uh, I know there have been a lot of uh, sophisticated tools as anyone would imagine when the FBI is involved in an investigation uh, to, to I mean the FBI is good at what they do to determine exactly whose voice and unequivocally, unequivocally and without any doubt that is my brother he is on the floor his mouth is being held shut by his assailant who is causing him to lose consciousness and he is using his remaining breaths to scream and call out for help I mean, again, you, you know, you, you talk in a very dramatic way about remaining breaths, as if your brother is literally on the verge of dying. But so many people are tweeting me saying, keep pushing on this, because if his brother was being beaten to within literally a moment before he dies, how can he be walking around so soon afterwards with apparently barely a scratch on him? I mean, I'm looking at him now. He's walking freely. There's no apparent sign of any serious injury. OK. The injury that happened to George are injuries that affected his breathing. Uh, they're not injuries that are going to show up on a videotape. Breaking your nose and swallowing copious amounts of blood, uh, and uh, like I said in the first interview, we're confident all of his medical records, when they come to light, as they come to light, in the court of law, which, will exonerate which, um, him. Which hospital did he have the broken nose reset? Pierce, I'm not getting into specifics about what doctor treated him, how he was treated. He was treated. There are medical records. If there is a, a relevant physician that will be subpoenaed in the court of law, he or she will be subpoenaed and will uh, give their testimony. Uh, and we're confident that testimony uh, will prove conclusively uh, and without a doubt my brother was attacked and his nose was broken. That was step one of, of the assault on him. In other words, that was the greeting. There was no... There was no uh, warning uh, you know that there was an altercation there was no indication to him that something could have gotten out of hand that maybe the situation you know it was time to run away there was no warning or 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 anything like that there was just simply no, but what people argue see robert is they, they like what the hell is george doing anyone near trayvon martin trayvon martin's a young kid unarmed he has a bag of skittles he just bought in a store he's just going home minding his own business why is your brother armed with a gun having made a 911 call specifically telling him not to follow, because he says, in answer to their question, yes, I'm following, specifically told not to. And he's still in the vicinity of Trayvon Martin. Why? If he hadn't been, if he just got back in his car and driven away, if he just carried on doing whatever he was doing with his life that night, Trayvon Martin would still be alive. The only reason Trayvon Martin is dead is because your brother decided that a young black teenager in a hoodie looked suspicious and then pursued him. Absolutely false, Pierce. Absolutely nothing could be further from the truth. But those are uh, inarguable facts, aren't they? No, because they're, he was they're a absolutely young... not. Well, it, well, it is, again, supposition. It's, no, but the it, the reason, not, no, but Robert, and, and you have to listen to the 911 tapes, that is and not, George's words explain it exactly. Robert, that is George's not, own words are in context. Robert, with respect, that is not supposition. What I just said was No, it factual. is supposition, because well, no, I'm, I'm going to quote to you let this tape. I'll quote to you exactly what he said in context of when he made the when he made the call. What he said was, hi, I'm calling because there have been a significant number of break-ins in my community. So he never called to say, hi, I'm calling because there's a black teenager in a hoodie. And you don't call the police 
in order to go co commit murder. You don't call the police and then kill somebody. I mean, that, that just does, you know, George's expectation was, was that the police would shortly be there. Uh, and that's it. That's what his expectation always was. And that is in his own words on those tapes. And that context is ignored. He didn't say, uh, hi, I'm calling because there's a black teenager. He said there's been a lot of uh, break-ins in the area. Uh, others have come out and talked about what the suspects have looked like. Uh, maybe that's what made George think that the police should be in the area so that the police could make the determination if that person was suspicious, if that situation was suspicious so why didn't or he not. leave it to the police? George did uh, leave it to the police. Well, he didn't, and, though, did he? No, he did. Mr. Martin had other plans for George that evening. Mr. Martin, Mr. Had, Martin had plans for George Zimmerman that evening? Evidently. Mr. Martin, as you put it, didn't know who George Zimmerman was. Well, Mr. Martin uh, was walking home to his evidently father's from, evidently girlfriend's from, house. His evidently, only plan was to buy some Skittles and go home and see the reason I'm pressing you on certain facts. That's is fine. That, is sure. that, you know, I'm not trying to get into the business of supposition and the case will now out. We'll see a trial. and I'm sure right. there'll be other stuff we don't know about. But in terms of right. the facts of the case that we know are inarguable, the reality is Trayvon Martin was a 17-year-old young black teenager in a hoodie who bought some sweets from a shop and was going back to his father's girlfriend's house. There was actually nothing suspicious about what Trayvon Martin was doing. And actually, if George had just stayed in his car or had heeded the advice of the 911 operator not to pursue him, then Trayvon Martin would still be alive. I mean, well, I understand why you defend your brother, but right. you must accept that as well, inarguable I, what, fact. What I can accept is that there were many safe nights and you know George foiled a robbery in progress that his neighbors enjoyed because on the nights that he was working he did walk around and report uh, suspicious persons that may or, may or may not have turned out to be suspicious he never expected when he made a 911 call uh, for any of this to happen nobody does when they when they just report things suspicious again the context in which he made that call and you have to understand Pierce this is a gated community. People have a gate up to keep crime out. There's a problem with crime in his community, a major problem with people coming, returning home to their homes and just finding their stuff gone or broken into or, be, or feeling unsafe because that's the kind of thing that goes on in his community. So George did not call. You keep referring, it could have been anybody in a hoodie or in a jersey or in a, a jersey sweater or, or, in, a, or in anything. If that was the description of the people who were committing crimes in his neighborhood, and he called in the context of, there are a lot of crimes being committed in this neighborhood, maybe the police should check this out. I don't see anything wrong with that, doing, doing that as a private citizen, and he did it as a private citizen. He reported something suspicious to the police. Now, conjecture takes over as, uh, to the part of, you know, there is no story, but to the part of the conjecture of, followed Mr. Martin, caught up to Mr. Martin, a, a uh, there was an exchange or some, you know something happened like that. Nothing happened like that. Mr. Martin, according to his uh, family's attorney, was on the phone with the girlfriend, who said, who's on tape saying, Trayvon said, no, no, I'm not going to run.